Okay, let's get underway. Um, good afternoon and thank you everyone for your attendance. This is our third and final instalment of our Community Leader Series with Leadership Wimmera and Wimmera Development Association. Uh, my name is Jessica Grimble and I'm your facilitator today and I'm very privileged um, to have absolutely wonderful panellists today, Joe Burke um, and Chris Coter. Chris, for the third time, absolutely wonderful to have you both on board and really um, fantastic to be working with both of you today. Um, before we begin, Wimmera Development Association and Leadership Wimmera would like to acknowledge the traditional owners groups on um, the land on which we meet, here in the Wimmera being the Wachabolic, Wagaya, Jabogok, Jadwa and Jadwajali people. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I do ask uh, that you mute your microphone during the presentation. We will have questions at the end um, and we are recording the forum as well for those who wish to revisit or share um, later on. Um, firstly, I introduce Chris Coder. Chris has unique insights and understanding of what leaders need to know and be able to do in order to deal successfully with adaptive challenges. Chris has facilitated consultations around Victoria for three Royal Commissions, including Royal Commissions into the 2009 bushfires, family violence, and now into our state's mental health system. Chris provides expert professional services in the fields of strategy, governance, leadership development, complex inquiries, reviews, and facilitation. She is a highly regarded independent chair, company director and strategic advisor to CEOs, senior executives, board chairs and directors, councillors and committees. Chris will unpack how people can embrace a new normal in changing environments and there's no better example than the current crisis we find ourselves in. We also find, uh, welcome our local guest, Jo Burke. Jo has held a number of leadership positions in the region and she's probably no stranger to most people on the call. Um, but today, appointed by the Victorian Government to chair the Wimmera Mallee Pipeline Project Planning Group in 2002, Jo will share some of her experience during this time of change. Uh, jo is also a member of the Leadership Wimmera Committee, so we thank you for joining us here today. Um, but I would like to start with Chris Coter, please. Thank you. And hello again, everybody. And hi, Jo. Looking forward to spending some time with you on the, on the screen, joining you on this really important topic. Uh, I, if I don't pick it up at the other end, can I just say thank you to Leadership Wimmera and the Wimmera Development Association because in the work that you've done in pulling these forums together, you've actually been living examples of exactly the sorts of topics and issues that we've talked about. So you are an extraordinary example of collaboration and caring enough about leadership to do something about it. So thank you about that. Thank you for that in advance. Um, I thought uh, the hour seems to go very quickly. So let me just begin with... Um, uh, this topic of creating a new normal in a in changing environments and just sort of double back a little bit just to see where we're all at at the moment. Um, I'm not in a suburb that's named as a hot spot or uh, might experience a lockdown before the day's over, but it just shows how quickly things are moving from the last couple of days when I when I spoke to you last time. And, and it seems to me that we've after, after we've had like sort of four months of uh, discomfort, anxiety. Um, probably a drop in physical, emotional, mental, and certainly financial health. Um, a lot of people that I'm talking to are really over it. I mean, they're, they're fatigued. Uh, they feel less able, if that's, if that's a way of describing it. They seem to be harder to motivate. Uh, there's a lot of frustration. Uh, all these restrictions that are there, and then they're not there, and then they're back again, and now they're different. And, and that, I think, is really testing trust in leaders. So I think that's a really important point to make at the front end. And I'm, I'm picking up on a lot of what I can describe as community anger, at least in Melbourne. Uh, and people are kind of kicking up saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do a test. I mean, I'm not going to have somebody from the government sticking a stick up my nose. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of kind of edgy, emotional backdrop to this conversation and yet uh, the point that I would make is if if we let that backdrop get to us uh, we won't create a new normal uh, the virus will create a new normal for us so without trying to speak in slogans I, I want to concentrate as much as I can on creating a new normal that we can actually control given that at the moment um, Indiana Jones isn't going to come along Mother Teresa it's too late for her to do anything. So, so it, it's what we've got is us. And I think there's a really significant moment of choice. We either let the future kind of take care of us, whatever that might look like, or we're actually in charge and we, 
we actually take control. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from, from Joe because um, I think there's something about bringing about sizable change or transformational change uh, that can take a long time that now you can look back and say was always there. And of course, it's wonderful to be able to hear Joe on, on this as, as we go through. Um, I think the starting point for this conversation is around a number of questions uh, that you don't need to answer now, but I'd put you on notice about them. Uh, the, the first one is really, can, can you actually build some kind of picture of what a new normal across your region might actually look like? like what, what could it possibly be? Uh, I've got some suggestions, but it's not for me to, to offer them. And that's part of the point that I think a lot of the changes that I think you're in control of uh, have to be developed from the ground up. In other words, based on your environment, uh, your circumstances, uh, the issues that you think that you have control over and what your communities think are the most uh, valuable and most pressing issues. So I could suggest something from out of town, but that's not the point. It's really something about uh, how do you create a new normal when you're close to and working with the people who are part of the heartland of, of your region. Uh, a couple of questions that fall out of that, something like, um, what's, what's really valuable to people in your community that you think is worth preserving? In other words, what do you really want to hang on to? What, um, what you might regret if it changes, but what's, what's really, really part of your community that you think you really, really need to hang on to? Uh, what can you actually improve when you think about the new normal? Is this an opportunity to uh, find some better days? And we talked a little bit about that in the previous forum. But the point for leadership is it's really staying in touch with community sentiment and what matters to people. And I think, I think the answer to that question of um, what would better days ahead look like could really be undermined. I think we're at a really kind of, if I'm picking up the community mood, at least with the people that I'm working with across the state, uh, we're at a point where we could be developing some really, what I'm just gonna describe as dangerous dependencies on temporary measures. I do worry about the period as we get closer to September, as some of the scaffolding dollars won't be there anymore, and we don't yet have an integrated plan for what that's supposed to look like. So what I'm gonna suggest is that we can prepare for what's up ahead for a new normal, that we can be in charge of a lot of what happens. And I think focusing on what we can't control just takes us back into that mindset of what's not possible and the sentimentality of things that we've lost and that we're filled with regret about. So I think there are probably a couple of ways of thinking about the new normal. Uh, the first is, are there some modest gains in the new normal that your leadership might be able to encourage? Uh, and they're based on things that are already predictable. In other words, can you get greater scale from the small acts of community service and kindness and volunteering? In other words, that's already going on. Is there some way that you can keep building on that? Uh, are you able to develop, these are just examples, of uh, plans for the most vulnerable people in your community, particularly around the reduction of support from government? You already know, because we're doing it right now, what the impact of technology is going to be in workplaces, in services, in businesses, uh, in towns and on the land. What, what, can, what can happen that can just strengthen access to technology and if people have struggled getting online this morning then that's 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 one one example it's not going to go away uh, you already have this is a, just another example that i can think of a really what i think is a successful tourism campaign is there a way of boosting that up a notch when you might not feel like it and seem to be in this lockdown conversation what what can you actually do to build on a campaign that's already running successfully my point about the modest gains is they're small bite size successes that you can then use to build the new normal. In other words, this is not starting with something that's a completely foreign idea, but starting to build on what's already in place and strengthening that. 
you could increase the stakes. And I think the, um, uh, the pipeline story is probably of the scale that really is a much more major transformational piece of work. So are there other major infrastructure projects, another build? Are there integrated service plans for some of the services in the community at the moment that could tighten up? And I won't go into the details about the Mental Health Royal Commission, except to say that there's a lot of evidence, at least in my hearing, of services that are doing extraordinary, extraordinary, wonderful work, often in isolation to each other. So is there some way in which from the client's point of view, from the lived experience point of view, we can strengthen integration? Uh, and what about regional recovery plans? So I have a lot of people in local government across the state saying to me, we need, we need a local, we, we need a, a statewide integrated recovery plan for the other side of COVID. And my answer to that is, well, why don't you start? What, why, why don't you have a go at, at a regional recovery plan? I'm just putting that in inverted commas. And I guess if I could just come off that previous example of the Mental Health Royal Commission, I've learned a lot about post-traumatic stress. Uh, I'd love to learn a lot more about post-traumatic growth and recovery. So I'm trying to coin a new phrase around that because what we're going through is really traumatic. So can we, can we shift the mindset to think not just of stress, which is absolutely real, but also of post-traumatic recovery and growth and what might that look like? And maybe that's going to involve thinking bigger geography. In other words, if you are thinking about recovery and adding the word prosperity to that, can that happen across a region? Can you think about neighbouring regions? Can you think about the state of Victoria? Can you think about neighbouring municipalities and whether they could join in a recovery plan that builds up from smaller locations into the larger scale? So I don't need to keep going on with examples, but I think that there's, dep depending on what you think the community appetite for change is, some way of already building on small successes through to uh, the larger scale, major transformational projects that can keep the community building. I think you have a real choice about building a new normal because um, I think you've been able to do this in some part already. I mean, the fact that you're, here, having a leadership conversation, I think, is a really um, important ingredient in that. I think, I think at least, that you have um, extraordinary natural assets as a region. Um, whenever I've been to your region, uh, which is about, I think, about the fifth, like it's about fifth the size of Victoria, um, I'm both surprised and shocked by how beautiful it is. Maybe I shouldn't be, but it is, it is an extraordinary place in terms of um, its ecology, its geography, its culture, its indigenous history, and the sort of creativity that I see lots of evidence of. Um, the last time I did that, I was on my way to Lake Mungo and I was just completely struck by uh, the region and almost to the point of driving off the road with some of the sites that I saw. So you're also known, of course, for your resilience. Uh, and all the hardships that come with drought and poor soil and uh, some of when I've looked at the history of the region goes right back to the stump jump plough and uh, the early models of soldier settlements. So I guess what I'm saying is that you have always been in the flow of creating new changes and new normals and it's really worth reminding yourselves of that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to throw to um, to Joe now. I want to come back I've, and I've done, um, I just, so I'm just going to say this to, to Joe and listeners on, on the way through. Um, in doing my homework about today and the work that Joe and others would have done, it struck me that what I should do is fetch up part of my previous professional life when I've worked very closely in and for uh, a variety of governments and what I did, and I'm not going to name names, Joe, but um, I think the work that you and others were involved in was more remarkable to me when I spoke to people who were in government at the time. I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to give names, but I suspect you might 
perhaps know who a couple of them might be. Because what I, what I want to encourage you to think about, all of you, is what transformational change or what a new normal looks like from outside and beyond. In other words, this is about change, this is about a new normal that can happen in a particular location, but really needs the scale of support from elsewhere. And so how you, how you go from, really interested in this, how you go from an, an idea of a new normal through to actually making it happen is an example that I think um, we can probably all gain a considerable amount from. So, Joe, do, do you mind coming in now? And mm -hmm. and and, and I'm I'm not uh, the the story that I've got at the other side. I'll let me say is a good one. So it's, it's not like I'm going to sneak up with you and uh, on you and say, oh, you should have done this. It would have been quicker. No, nothing. Of the sort. No, no, nothing of the sort. In fact, it's quite it's it's quite the opposite. And and the reason that I find it quite breathtaking. And I was not work. I have to say up front, I was not working in government in that area that had anything to do with this particular project on the way through. But what I find quite extraordinary, having worked um, uh, with politicians and in political settings, is um, uh, you got this up and running when uh, the government of the day didn't have the seat in your area. Mm. So uh, there, there are some really interesting elements about creating a new normal that are an example to me of how um, they're often made up of small pieces that don't line up in a straight line or a nice kind of elegant curve. They can take place over a longer period of time and maybe feel like they're messy in the middle. You see, I think any change that I'm aware of, um, particularly the grander scale, projects and transformations um, it makes me think that everything can look like a failure in the middle because you can't you don't quite know how it's going to shape up so um so Jud, if if you if you were to if you were to come in at this point and perhaps if i join you in conversation a little the other side of it, i'm going to encourage as jessica's done previously to to have participants drop in questions in a in the in the in the chat sidebar that we might be able to come back to later. But uh, Joe, we're in conversation, so over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, got me a bit concerned about what um, <laughs> what you might have, but um, thanks, leadership women, for the opportunity. Um, and the the topic creating a new normal in changing environments. Actually, the pipeline exemplifies that whole um, concept. And we recently um, celebrated the 10 year anniversary of the construction of the, the main part of the pipeline. And for most people in our region, it is the new normal. Um, and for some people to, that can't really think about pre-pipeline um, in any real sense of the word. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, process, uh, the processes that we went through um, and focusing on the consultation process with regional and government stakeholders um, and the management of information and process. So just a bit of um, background uh, in the timeline. Um, so in 1890, um, there's a discussion documented to um, replace part of the pipeline with wooden pipes. So as far back as 1890, people were thinking about how, uh, how we can improve the system. But when we started, um, we had 18,000 kilometres of open channel uh, built around rivers and streams. Um, an average of 120,000 megalitres was harvested every year. Um, and of that 120, only 17,000 was actually used in the 36 towns and over 7,000 farms. So the numbers just don't, didn't stack up sustainably. Uh, so the majority of that 100 odd thousand megalitres was lost through channel seepage and evaporation. Um, so back in, 2000, in the year 2000, uh, was the, we were in drought. We had water restrictions on farms and towns. 
waterway health re deteriorating and we really um, were starting to monitor that. Um, federally, we had um, a discussion around water policy reform uh, based around environmental outcomes. And the Victorian government were um, looking at water investment and planning statewide. We had the technology, uh, polypipes, um, monitoring systems, uh, much better than the wooden pipes they have talked about in the 18th century. And through lobbying, the count, regional councils and water authorities um, started the discussion. So in 2002, um, the re a regional committee was appointed by the Victorian government um, and endorsed by the feds. And I was set to chair that um, to prepare a business case um, and the detailed design uh, to pipe the system. So the committee was a diverse group of regional leaders um, and we were charged to uh, oversee the consultation process um, as well as uh, in developing the um, business case, we were managing a range of engineer designers, environmental experts, agricultural and community planners, um, and community consultation specialists. The other part of our role was advocacy to state and federal government, because when we started, there was no policy for this sort of thing and there was no money. Um, so starting in 2002, uh, late in 2003, we delivered an interim business case um, with another two years of detailed work on the design and planning. And we were pressured to deliver that interim business case because of the, um, the drought circumstances in the region. So in 2005, Construction began um, and there was still design work going on at that time. And uh, 2005, so in 2010, the construction was complete. And the only, we, did, we were planning on a 10 year um, construction plan. We actually had contingencies in the design for 20 year um, construction um, and it was completed in five. Um, because of the drought. Um, so it was done ahead of time, way ahead of time and on budget. So that's something that we're very proud of in the region. So in talking about the you know, changing environment, um, one of the first things that we did was to develop the vision of what we had um, or what we were trying to achieve. And the vision wasn't about pipes or uh, water supply. Um, it was more strategic than that. And it's perhaps relatable to the, the COVID-19 situation that we're in now. We have to actually lift our chins a bit to think about what, um, what it is that we want for our, um, our future. Um, and it's not about relating to what's happening now. It's about being more aspirational. So our vision was pretty simple. Um, it was a future for our children. Um, so we talked about under that banner, um, security of supply of water, um, greatly improved water quality, which is really undersold still. We talked about water for growth and investment, and of course, returning water to the environment. All of those things captured uh, different aspects of what we were trying to do, but under the banner of, we were looking to secure a future for our kids. Um, and the other catchphrase that we used was, the status quo was not sustainable. And I think that's, that style of thinking perhaps relates to our current situation as well. So basically the vision was a one pager, was easily understood um, and relatable. Um, so wherever we talked about, um, you know, whether it was the environment, we need to fix the environment so our kids have got choices. Uh, we need to improve water quality so we can build jobs for the future. All of those sorts of things. Um, it actually aligned quite nicely, which we didn't realise until later, with some of the government headline policies 
um, particularly with the federal government and their environmental um, discussions. Um, our vision provided taglines for the marketing of the project, both within the region and externally. And importantly, it, it unified our team and kept us on track. So um, in the early days, the pipeline project, it was very easily easy to get sidetracked um, and captured by um, things that weren't the main game, if you like. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the mistakes we made, um, because I think um, they're the things that you learn from and uh, particularly stay with you for future discussions along similar lines. Um, so the regional environment, um, we didn't think that we'd have the millennial drought while we were doing this project. We knew we had a couple of dry years at the start, but um, that in some ways hindered um, the discussion, but in other ways, it actually fast-tracked the project um, politically. Um, there was a genuine belief in the region that it would never happen. And that was a major hurdle in the early days. People um, just couldn't see that the scale of the job we were, we were trying to pull together could actually get achieved, that the government would support our region to that extent. Uh, we absolutely underestimated the drought stress on farmers, the grief and loss that our farmers were uh, experiencing at the time. Um, and that manifested it in lots of different ways. Um, I actually had in a series of forums that we held, I had a group of, small group of farmers follow me to every forum and just harangue. They just didn't, um, didn't agree with what we were trying to do and couldn't see what uh, we were trying to achieve at the time. Um, they're converts now. Um, and it didn't, it took me a little while to actually realise that the stress that were on these, this group of people, they just couldn't cope with one more thing um, to think about. So um, in the end, we had farmers apologising for their mates um, in public meetings, which, um, yeah, which is, uh, yeah, was what it was at the time. And there was a lack of understanding in the regional community about the complexity of the program. You know, people just seemed to think we could lay pipes in channels and roll it out and the water situation would be uh, saved. It was much more complex than that. So many more things to consider. So doing water restructure discussions when people just didn't have any water um, was very, very difficult. Uh, one of the really key mistakes we made early on, and I think this also is relatable to our current situation, is that the sheer scale of the task, we actually um, brought in consultants to so assist us with the consultation. And that was, uh, we made the mistake of letting them front public meetings and forums. And, um, so they got up there, mispronounced town names, didn't appreciate um, the uh, culture of agriculture, the seasonality of agriculture, and uh, we copped wax from quite a few people and in the end had to reverse that and take over the, the fronting of the consultation process ourselves, um, which, uh, with the timeframes and the scale of the region uh, was a huge job. Um, the consultation also, we, were, we went out initially seeking ideas and trying to understand what people's issues were. Um, and because of the environment, regional environment, people were wanting answers. We were asking questions, looking for what people thought and People came along to these meetings seeking answers. They wanted to know what, 
what we were going to do, how we were doing it, and how much it was going to cost. Um, so it was really hard when we got to the point where we were starting to get a bit of a picture of what we were doing to ask the question about, you know, what do you value? What are the betterment opportunities? How can we improve the regional situation through this process? Um, and a lot of those sorts of ideas came very late in the development of the design uh, because people were just not able to think about it early in the process. Um, so it was balancing the need to inform people about what we were doing, but also be open to input and providing that feedback loop. Um, and uh, it was very challenging. Um, and I, I was grey before we started it, but I was greyer by the time we'd finished it. Um, so, and we were also under pressure. Uh, to form decisions when we didn't have the data and having information and data is critical, um, particularly um, with the technical side of it, but we were looking for uh, data to inform some significant policy changes in the region around things like allocation and entitlements, um, things like costing the uh, you know what was the cost of environmental water in our region you know those sorts of things we just didn't have the information um, when we needed it um, and so there was quite a few of some of those uh, political presentations where I stood there really confident uh, without really knowing what it was yet but we got there um, so uh, some of the issues that we didn't see coming and, um, yeah, as I said, the millennial drought um, put enormous pressure on the regional community to um, move quickly. Um, partisan politics from local members due to election cycles came into it as well. Um, and uh, that was uh, particularly disappointing. Um, we had a couple of issues where um, the politics between state and federal government um, really muddied the water and tainted uh, the progress that we were making regionally. Um, the number and quality of um, some of the pop-up leaders, I call them, uh, people that came out of our regional community passionate about sometimes single issues, but often quite strategic. Um, and it we made a real effort to keep them informed so that they could support uh, the process as it went on going. Um, Talking about managing conflict during the process, um, part of the issue was around um, recognising the different drivers of people. So some people go high, they understand the vision, they'll work towards the vision or even if they don't agree with that vision, they've got an alternate. Other people go pretty low looking at the personal impact. And one of the things that working on this project taught me was that both of those are equally relevant. We often discount the people that go the low road um, and only um, argue or present um, their personal impact. It's equally relevant um, and uh, needs to be given um, space and airtime. You need to acknowledge conflict, um, try and understand uh, alternate positions, uh, respect, um, is important um, and one of the things that uh, we made a practice of during the process was invite solutions. Um, so um, if people have an issue invite them to offer a solution up and in fact a couple of those we took on board during the uh, process and the environmental um, ponds, frog ponds they were called during the planning process that were developed came directly out of um, landowners developing a, a solution to what they saw as a problem. 
Um, negotiation. Um, so uh, during this, I think we've negotiated with everyone in during this process. Um, we tried to work with uh, groups of people, different sectors, uh, different geographical groups. Um, but then sometimes you just had to make a call. So uh, when in a hundred years time, when the history people are looking at the um, configuration of the pipeline, they won't be able to work out why the pipe goes zigzag in a couple of spots. Well, we were just moving too quickly to negotiate with that person. So we went around them. Didn't happen very often, but uh, there's a few cases in the region where that happened. And the, uh, one of the biggest negotiations that I had that was ongoing was around with the federal water policy bureaucrats. And um, they're in the process of developing um, their uh, federal water policy. It had been a big gap and it was around um, their focus is on the environment, returning water to the environment. Uh, it was start of, the start of the Murray-Darling Basin plan. Um, we had some interesting discussions about how you actually value, uh, put a dollar value um, on environmental water. Um, and some of the things that in their policy framework they saw as setting the scene um, didn't really fit our region and wouldn't fit most regions. So, they were interesting discussions. One of the most memorable negotiations was a Sunday morning phone call that I had from contractors where they were moving equipment down in Halls Gap and uh, a businessman in Halls Gap just lay on the road in front of their equipment and refused to move. So I got out of my flannelette pajamas and drove to Halls Gap and negotiated with these people. And, and that, I use that as an example of um, how passionate people got about for and against the project in the initial phase, as well as during the construction. Um, but then I have um, had one older farmer actually at the um, official opening of the, or the completion so, um, celebrations come up and thank me. He was one that stood up at a meeting early in the piece and said, never in my lifetime will I see this pipeline. And he actually lived to celebrate the end of the, the construction. So the lessons learned, um, I think the value of true community engagement uh, where people are absolutely committed to uh, the full engagement process, including feedback and, and repolicying. Um, shared vision is critical and um, sharing as widely as you can. Data, knowledge and information is the only way you're going to implement change successfully. Um, State federal politics is a very murky place and um, very challenging to try and influence. Uh, and I don't think that's going to improve in the near future. Um, the change process can take a huge personal toll. And so you really need to look after yourself um, and the others around you. Um, the value of a mentor uh, during difficult times is invaluable uh, and uh, not someone too close to the project or the issue that you're working on, but someone that can um, steer your conversation a bit. Um, and bottom line, trust your instincts. Gut feels are a great guide. Um, if you inform yourself as much as you possibly can, and then really go, go with your gut. Um, personal ethics are foundation. Uh, you need to have a very clear picture of what your personal ethics are, what you will and will not do. Um, and uh, 
So uh, I'm really proud of that my involvement in the pipeline um, and the legacy, because both my girls moved away from the region. They're both bounced back with, and they've both got families here. And uh, those kids are going to have a future in this region because of the work that we did. Thanks, Jess. Brilliant, Joe. That's um, absolutely amazing. I was writing down questions as I went, and of course, um, not surprisingly, you addressed all of the aspects that I was going to raise. Um, I will throw back to Chris if you would like to respond. Sure. And um, look, if there are questions, then the, please let us know through the chat site. Um, so I want to come at, uh, at what you just heard from Joe from the other side, which was uh, from within state government and looking at this new normal from the perspective of a partner, uh, and Joe, just jump in and correct me if I get this wrong, a partner who you needed, uh, as opposed to it being a kind of optional, nice to have state government on board, but go away and if you don't support us, we'll do it ourselves. So, um, so remember that this was a, I'm assuming a critical partnership. Mm. It turned out to be very, very successful. Uh, the story that, I heard from uh, those that I spoke to about Joe's story was uh, used as an example, and I've heard it several times over now, as a really successful transformational project. And from the other side, what it took to persuade state government mm -hmm. to support and, and come on board. And um, because these stories are told as if they're slightly apocryphal, can I say that um, state government, uh, I'm just uh, generalising wildly, um, is also proud of that work. So there's mm. something about mm. in what Joe was saying about sharing the success. Uh, and if there's win-win available, then there's something really useful in that. So coming at this from the other angle, what I'm told was really successful was, remember that this wasn't a seat that the government of the day in Victoria actually held. Uh, it seems that what was really required was a catalyst. Uh, and the catalyst for change, and I'm just going to go back to what I said at the beginning of this presentation, uh, we're really tired and just over so much of what's happened over the last couple of months. And it's easy for a catalyst to change to become apathetic or disheartened or just just give up. So this is a this is a piece of work when you think about the new normal that requires persistence and replenishment of heart and energy. So from the government's point of view, uh, a catalyst for change was certainly in evidence. In other words, it was an idea and a proposal, and that's the language that I've heard, but Joe, you're describing a business plan, so I think we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, an idea and a proposal, um, the time of which had come. In other words, the, the timing is a real, was real, a really important element in this. So choosing the best time, ideally in the political cycle, or this development of this particular partnership was really important. Was it luck? Was it cleverness? Was it strategy? I don't know, but it was an idea that fell on the right time. Um, those who then spoke to government, I don't know who, who that was, but I'm just saying that um, those who then spoke to state government came with a, a sense of um, united energy. This is just my, my phrasing. In other words, it seemed to have, from Gov State Government's point of view, support from across the whole community. At least that's, that's what it felt like. In other words, the group had done their homework and had gathered support around that particular proposal. It was very, very important that that had happened. Now, the message or the story that government heard was... Uh, I'm just summarising now, all this is my language, I'm not quoting anybody, I'm not breaching any confident, confidential information either. Uh, the story or the message that they heard was that it's actually a really good story, that there was value for people, mm. that it was about improvement. 
that it was about adding value, that it was, yes, it was, it was a concrete story. In other words, it was technical, it was infrastructure, uh, but also that the community by and large wanted this to happen. Uh, they also heard from people who claimed at least that we can do this. In other words, it wasn't a folly. It wasn't a kind of um, completely romantic, unreasonable, idealistic idea, that it was actually something that people said they could do. And it had a really strong emotional connection to those that heard this story in state government. The quote that was given to me was, um, at the time they heard representation from your community to say, without this, there is no future for the region. Now, I don't know whether that's an actual quote, but that's what was heard. Mm. So in other words, it created a sense of urgency. It was realistic, it was concrete. And the government could see that it would offer a win-win situation, but they could also claim some benefit from this. They, all these are very, very important elements because it strikes me that um, the chances of you, so you're in control of a lot, but some of the things that you're not in control of in creating a new normal, are politics and the process of um, politicians and how you get decisions up from government. And that doesn't go away. And in the period of time that we're looking at, I mean, you've got local government elections right across the state in mm. a very short period of time. Um, so, so politics doesn't leave the story of major mm. transformation and creating a new normal. So having political nous, I think, is probably one of those elements that, at least from the perspective of state government at the time, was really important. Uh, the, other, the other element of this, and, I, and I'm mean this very positively when I say that there was um, persistent lobbying. In other words, it wasn't just kind of one attempt to convince and persuade. There was actually a concerted effort. And it struck me that as I was listening to <clears throat> those people I was talking to, what they found was, um, so yes, the business plan was important. The numbers are always important. It's very hard to think about creating a new normal without having, as Joe says, the data. Uh, never tell a story without data and, <laughs> and, and never just give data without the story. So the combination of having that homework um, was really, really important. The costs always matter. The numbers always matter. Um, but there was something about, something about those who heard this story who found the people telling the story good to deal with. Now, that's just... That's just my reflection on the way they were now telling me this story in hindsight. In other words, um, when you're working in a minister's office, uh, while you're working, Joe's just told you about this, there will always be people who say no a lot. Mm. For, good, for good reasons, not because, not because they're nuisances, though sometimes that's true. But a government, in government, you hear no a lot, or stop this, or not now, or that's too much. Of, uh, we're always too fast, too slow, too big, too small. There's always, so it's the sort of opinion industry that, that will cut across whatever you're trying to do, because you're dealing with things that are really, um, that really affect people emotionally. So I guess what, reminded me of was how important it is to have the messengers who are telling the story of the new normal mm. who can tell the story in such a way that uh, that it is uh, persuasive uh, where the change is clear and Joe's point's really interesting and I think that's true for the period up ahead um, mm. lots of people in the community at the moment wish that government could just make up its mind about the restrictions. It's just simple, isn't it? Can we go out? Can we stay here? Uh, well, what can we do? What can't we do? Of course, my guess is in Spring Street at the moment, my guess is uh, that there's fast and furious consideration of any number of really mm -hmm. deeply complex issues all braided together, all requiring uh, legal uh, considerate. What happens if we do this? What happens? Massive scenario. I'm, I'm guessing, but that's, that's, usually what happens because we haven't been in this situation before we've got to make um this happened a lot during the bushfires royal commission where we had emergency services workers say to us it was changing so quickly we just had to we just had to throw away we just had to throw away the manual 
In other words, if that happens, and we don't have a manual for what we're going through at the moment, but people want the simple answer when it's often much more complex and complicated than that. If you haven't got the manual anymore, what you're left with is judgment. And you're also dealing with people who will always tell you uh, for nothing how you could do your job a lot better. So Joe's story is really insightful about uh, understanding that the new normal will affect people at a micro level, life in miniature, mm -hmm. my street, my neighbourhood, my property, my family, my kids. And that the grand vision is sometimes, uh, whilst it's really attractive to a lot of people, is so far out there that it's very hard to see. And I think in Joe's story, or at least the way I've heard it told back to me, something really important happened. Um, so let me just match this with an insight that I've had just because of my own circumstances with those three Royal Commissions. During the Bushfires Royal Commission a few weeks after that, I could actually stand on a property that had been burned to the ground. I could actually still smell the smoke. I could hear the crunch of, and you can probably do this with your imagination now, what it feels like to walk through ash. And I bet that if I asked you to think about one of the symbols of that time, a koala drinking out of a water bottle, I bet that you can bring that picture back into your imagination. Uh, Family Violence Law Commission. Uh, I thought I knew a lot about this through research and theoretical work because that's all that I could do. It made much, much more sense to me to be in the company of a woman who was um, very badly scarred because he had set fire to her several times. And the Mental Health Royal Commission. Uh, standing with someone who says there are so many holes in the system, I've fallen through the cracks, I've tried to commit suicide four times and I'm just too stupid to get right. Boy, that really taught me something about uh, the inside of people's lives when they're dealing with the system or with change over which they have no or little control. I think one of the challenges in depicting the story of the new normal is to deal with is to deal with something that's very abstract at the moment, but to try to make it much more concrete. In other words, if 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 I try to understand um, the virus from an epidemiologist's point of view, I'm just I'm not going to have a clue. But I'll have plenty of opinions about whether or not I ought to go on a tram. My point is that a lot of change that's happening at the moment is really abstract. You'll get much more traction, I think, particularly at a local level, if you can tell the story of the thought that Joe was talking about by making it real for people's lives. In other words, um, and this is why I'm, I'm not really suggesting to people in local government at the moment that you wait for some state-based integrated recovery plan. A lot of this recovery work will happen at a local level with small steps in much smaller size geography so trying to match the difficulty that people have in their imagination and think how hard this is. Like, what even is this virus? Um, where did it come from? Uh, how long is it going to last for? How is it going to affect my family? And now unless I know someone who's affected by it and I don't, what you're asking me to do is imagine what it's like if someone I don't know might catch it because I'm out on the street. So to try to reduce the gap between what we're asking people to imagine and what we ask them to do to try to keep that gap as small as possible and ground the next experience of the new normal into reality in their day-to-day -day lived experience is a really important part of the storytelling. So there might be a, a couple of questions before we uh, before we close. Jess, do you want to let us know about anything that we might pick up on, either Joe or I? Certainly. So I have a question for Joe from Greg. Um, Greg asks, are there any benefits that have sprung out of the pipeline that you didn't anticipate? And would climate change be a new normal for the region that the pipeline has partially addressed? Mm. Well, the, the first big one, yes, climate change. Um, 
when we were doing the initial um, planning for the pipeline um, was when the, um, oh, I've lost it now, the CSIRO, I think it might have been, uh, the different um, climate change scenarios were coming out. Um, and whilst we factored that into some of our water planning, um, we didn't take it out into any of the consultation because it, um, we didn't have any expertise and the very fact that the pipeline's built now and we've saved so much water um, and water savings has conti have continued on farms, um, we're best place now than probably most regions in Australia um, to address climate change um, as it relates to water. Um, what was the other one? Sorry, Jess. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any benefits that have sprung out of the pipeline that you didn't Oh, uh, yeah. So one of the things um, that springs straight to mind is sort of late in the design process, uh, we had some uh, deputations from uh, landowners around putting fire hydrants in the rural pipeline. Um, and that was a, a new idea, um, similar to urban, urban um, um, water pipes have hydrants in them. Um, so it came in late in the discussion and uh, then we sort of went with it for a little while and then the CFA got involved um, and they were very uh, prescriptive around um, what that might look like. Uh, which ended up costing a lot of money, but I think ended up making a really good addition to uh, the pipeline. So there's uh, hydrants on the pipeline mains and you'll see water tanks dotted around in the more remote areas of the region uh, for use uh, by firefighters. Um, and, you know, going back to the climate change discussion, that is just going to be more critical um, uh, as we go forward, like we've lost the dams from the landscape um, and replaced them with hydrants and tanks. Thanks, Joe. And I'm going to stick with you. I've got a question from Penny, which is actually for both of you, but we'll start with Joe first. Um, your work, the majority of your work's been within male dominated fields. So, what would be one piece <laughs> of advice you would give um, to be heard and respected by male peers? Um, well, probably the, the foundation piece for me is uh, don't see gender yourself. Um, and uh, with respect to other people um, seeing gender, uh, just work bloody harder than anyone else. Um, and, and you often hear people say that, but it's actually um, true because you can make a mistake um, a professional mistake and um, some people will judge you um, as a female. Um, a, a bloke would make it and it's just you know, damned unlucky. But um, I, I, my view has always been to go uh, into the workplace, into um, wherever you're being active, um, genderless. Um, don't see gender and don't be gender. But I must admit, I have been asked to make a coffee for a bloke one day, <laughs> and I did. I made him a coffee, but he was so embarrassed when we sat down at the table and I was sitting at the front. <laughs> Good on you, Joe. I'm sure we've all got an experience yeah. to share like that. Chris, would you yeah. like to respond to that question before we wrap up today? It's a great answer. It's a great answer. And, and, and I do think... so. Uh, uh, for, it's it's useful to try to make the problem in, invisible and not make it a problem, if I can put it that way. And I think that there is a responsibility for the people who are catalysts of change of the sort that we're talking about to really welcome, and this takes some humility, uh, really welcome the ideas of uh, them. Act as if other people are your teachers. And if that happens, then there isn't, there isn't a kind of, oh, well, of course you'd say that because of your background or who you are or where you come from. You see, I think the, I think the leader to make the most or the biggest change or the biggest difference in creating a new normal um, have a whole range of different skills and attributes. And I think that they are generally curious people. I think that they turn up. I think mm. that they have drive. And I think that they always believe that 
uh, any plan is really only based on best guesses. And if you believe that, then you're also open to learning from everybody. In other words, um, your community are your best teachers and there's no need to filter out who that person is or where they're from or who their politics, or any of that, including, including gender. So I think it's down to leadership to open up those conversations and to welcome as much diversity and as much change and as much and offer as much humility to try to, um, I guess, not segment the community in such a way that you could anticipate where the answers might be coming from. So, um, and I guess Joe and, and your colleagues must have done a very extraordinary uh, job in making that amount of change happen. And it just reminds me that if you had uh, the vision, someone had a vision for changing the system that you're talking about back in 1890. Uh, and it took uh, to 2010 to bring that about that the changes that we're talking about can take a long period of time, except that, and this is a really important lesson that you remind us of, that during difficult times, you've got an accelerant for change. Mm. Uh, as the millennium drought did for you and as the circumstances that we're dealing with at the moment are providing for us. So I wish you all well in all the changes that you're bringing about. Um, I hope that you have lots of energy. I hope you have lots and lots of opportunity to be reinvigorated and to keep growing the future on behalf of the people that you're working with. Um, I'm never far away if I can continue or enter or uh, be part of your conversation and I'd continue to like to do that. So um, thanks, Jess and Joe and all the good people who have come together to make these three sessions happen. I hope to see you all soon. I've actually been offered um, the invitation of a tour. <clears throat> there's wine and there's um, good times to be had the next time I'm in your region. I really look forward to that. But thank you, everybody. Thanks, Chris. That's a wonderful way to finish. And what a privilege um, it's been today well, over a number of weeks to work with Chris um, and to work with Joe as well. Um, absolutely admire both of your work. So um, if I can be so self-indulgent, it's been an absolutely um, wonderful day and absolute delight to spend some time with you. I'd also like to recognise our other panellists that we've had over the journey. Liana Thompson of Northern Grampians Shire, Josh Koenig of Uniting Wimmera and Horsham Rural City Council, and Amelia Crafter of the Wimmera Healthcare Group for their time and assistance in delivering uh, the forums and just being so open and sharing um, such wonderful advice and such personal advice as well is very, very, we're very grateful for that. Um, if anyone wishes to watch a recording of today or any of the other weeks um, or wish to share it, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, it is on our Women Development Association uh, YouTube page um, and this will be available later today. Um, we'd also really like to hear from you. So for those on the call or for people that have participated in the previous forums, we'll be sending out a short survey um, would really love your feedback on what you liked and, and perhaps what you would like more of or, or less of or something that we didn't cover off. Um, be really keen to hear from you so that that can um, inform our future decisions for Leadership Wimmera and also for Wimmera Development Association more broadly. Um, leadership is such a big part of what we do and it feeds into so many of the areas in which we work. So um, thank you very much for your attendance for coming along. Again, thank you to Chris and Joe. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.